I mean, anybody can make money with real estate. Ow. Okay, maybe not everybody, but there's no denying that if you want to build wealth, if you want to make money, Real estate investing is one of the best options, but you're probably like me and you have a ton of fear. You don't know where to start. It's so scary. Because let's face it, there are tons of different ways that you can make money with real estate investing. Do you wanna be a landlord? Do you wanna flip properties? Do you wanna go into wholesaling? The list goes on and on. And what I wanted to tackle today is one of the easiest and probably one of the safest ways that you can invest into real estate without a ton of risk. But I am clearly not the expert when it comes to this topic, so I thought it would be better, let me bring on somebody who knows what the heck they are talking about. All right, Ryan, I don't know if I shared this in the last time that we spoke, but there was a time in my life where I thought I was going to become this amazing real estate investor, tried getting a few properties, didn't quite work out, probably gave up a little bit too premature, it did leave me to blogging and other things. So it, it all worked out in the end. But I know I'm not the only one that has an interest in becoming a real estate investor. Very overwhelming, a lot of different options. I hear wholesaling as being a good option. That was an option that somebody else told me about. But once again, like I don't know anything about real estate. So when I hear wholesaling, I think Costco. So help me understand what wholesaling is in regards to real estate investing. I love it. And I love you bringing up Costco because uh, that's one of the ways I teach my boys about wholesaling, right? So I can go to Costco and I can buy 50 water bottles for $5, right? Or I can go to the basketball game and spend $4 on one, one bottled water, right? When you look at that, the whole idea is it's all about timing and it's all about opportunity and it's all about supply and demand. This whole concept of wholesaling is getting properties that can't be sold on the open market. And let me explain this. So banks are only going to lend on properties that are in good condition, meaning if the roof's caving in or it doesn't have a driveway put in or if the kitchen's missing or there's been a flood in it or whatever the case is, you can't just go down to Bank of America or Chase or Wells Fargo or whoever. You can't just go to those places and say, I want to buy this property because they want to make sure the property is inhabitable, especially if you're trying to get like an FHA loan, which is what most people are doing. So wholesalers are going and targeting properties that have some equity and where the person actually has some motivation where they're needing to sell that property to an investor that is going to where the property actually needs work in, in most cases, right? In most of the cases, it's going to be something where the property actually needs work. So for somebody that, you know, is new to real estate in, regard, in regards to investing, wholesaling is not this brand new concept that just came out. Like this has been going on for quite some time. Is that true? Yeah, it's, it's just, it's the same thing where it's like buying something and instead of fixing up or turn around selling it and making as much profit as you can, it's marking up a little bit and letting somebody else do that. So the whole concept here is if I go and put this property under contract and rather than me doing all the work, I may mark up the property $10,000 or $20,000 and give it to you, Jeff. And you're like, oh, you found the property. I want to fix the property up. And you say, well, I'll give you an assignment fee of $10,000 or $20,000 for finding this property property, but then I'm going to fix it up and sell it and I'll make a profit on the end or I'll keep it as a rental property. And so I think wholesalers are really good about locating properties and finding somebody else that would work really well for it. Because you might be a landlord and somebody else might be a fix and flipper and you might like properties in this area and somebody else might like properties in this area. So the idea of wholesaling is just getting a good deal under contract and selling that piece of paper to somebody else. It's kind of like an option, you know, where you get it under contract and, and sell the paper to somebody else. So if somebody is listening to this for the first time, I think you could probably tell for the few minutes that we've been talking, I'm sorry, that Ryan has been talking, he knows a thing or two about real estate investing. And that's why I wanted him to come on the show. You know, Ryan, he is the income hacker. I think your bio says that you bought your first duplex at 21. 21. Uh, I, could, I can tell you that I was not investing at 21. There were a lot of other things I was doing that I was <laughs> at 21. So I respect the fact that you got your first real estate investment property at the age of 21. I know that we talked about like, what would be some great content Content, you know, for the show and for my viewers and for many of my subscribers, my listeners, they're new to real estate or they, they want to learn. They're eager to learn, scared. They don't know where to start. And we talked about how you had a seven step blueprint or, you know, just seven simple steps of how to get started 
with wholesaling in regards to real estate investing. So that's why I just want to go ahead and just dive into that. You know, what is step number one? Unless you feel like you need to explain wholesaling a little bit more, feel free. If not, we can dive into step one. Well, I think one thing that's important with wholesaling is it's really attractive to like wholesale. It's like find a property that's a good deal, sell it to somebody else, mark it up a little bit, and it's half the process. It doesn't take as much time. Uh, there's less risk on that because you're not dealing with market fluctuations. But one of the greatest things about wholesaling is I can get a property under contract and I can be very upfront with them and say, hey, I think I can buy this, but give me a period of time for due diligence. And I only need to move forward with my acquisition if I find a new buyer. And if I'm unable to find an end buyer that's going to buy the property from me, I can remove myself for the contract, which basically means I have pre-sold the property before I close on it, if I need to do a double closing, or I can sell the paper before I even need to execute on it. So one of the things that attracts a lot of people to wholesaling is the lower amount of risk on the deal, because I don't need to get a loan. I don't need to close on the property. I don't need to do anything on the property until I've actually found a new buyer I'm going to sell it to. So that's one of the things that's really sexy about wholesaling is there's a lot less risk involved with it. And you're only doing a part of the process. Awesome. That's great. I love that. The whole, the pre-sale and knowing that you got the buyer, I will say, you know, there is this step of finding the property. I don't know if you address this in your, your seven steps. If you do, we can wait until then. I know like my brain starts saying, okay, that sounds simple. How do I find a property? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Part of the seven steps, a lot of the seven steps is actually finding that good opportunity because you can't just go on the MLS and talk to a real estate agency, find me a deal that I can mark up a little bit and sell to somebody else that they can fix it up and then sell it for a profit. It really doesn't work like that because what you've got to do is solve somebody's problem where they're in a predicament where a traditional real estate sale is not going to be a solution for them. That's going to be part of our seven steps that we're going to be going through here as well. There are are some downsides to wholesaling. You're not going to make as much money as when you're fix and flipping because you're marketing up a little bit, kind of like a wholesale type example. So that's kind of some downsides to it. You're obviously not going to be getting residual cash flow. You're getting a chunk of money. And when it's done, it's done. And you've got to go find another property. And I often get asked, like, how much money can you make wholesaling? And I've seen people make anywhere from a couple hundred dollars to I've seen wholesale deals where they've made $92,000 wholesaling a property uh, to another buyer. So I would say the average is somewhere around five to ten thousand dollars but the extremes are anywhere from like 500 to uh, ninety two thousand dollars is one of the bigger ones i've ever seen uh, for people that are listening to this in different parts of the country whether you're living in a city or living in the suburbs does that change does that affect like where you live as far absolutely. as absolutely okay so <laughs> absolutely like so for somebody like right now, I live in the Nashville, uh, Nashville, Tennessee area. You know, it's one of the many areas that real estate just keeps continuing to soar. Compare that to maybe like a small town where real estate prices are more, I'll say stable. I haven't really gone up a lot. Is there, I'm, I'm assuming there's opportunities in both, but is the more competitive area like Nashville harder to make a profit with wholesaling or like, what would you feel more comfortable choosing of those two? Well, well, I think it really comes down to what the median price range is. If the median price range in the area is 500,000 versus the median price range in the area being $75,000, you're just going to have more margin to work with. So if I'm going to make a 10% margin on a half a million dollar house, I'm going to make 50 grand. If I'm going to make a 10% margin on a $50,000 house, I'm going to make five grand. So I think it has to do with the median price ranges that you're dealing with in the area. The other thing you're going to have to look at is competition. But one of the things we talk about actually in our seven steps is how do to identify the zip codes that are going to be the best opportunity for you to wholesale in. The way we do that is we use some data and find out how many fix and flips are happening in your area. So you can look by zip code and you can see how many properties have been bought and sold within the same year. And then you can sort that by zip code and say, there's a lot of flips that are happening in these zip codes, which means I want to fish where the fish are. So those are the areas I want to be targeting. Because if I'm a wholesaler, if there's flips happening, buy and sell in the same year, those are people I want to go after. And that's one of the cool things about wholesaling is I can actually identify properties, but I can also identify people that are willing to buy properties because they already have. If I have investors that have already bought properties in the zip code, I can talk to them and say, would you be interested in buying the property I just found? And I've got a built-in buyer in lots of cases that I can target. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I know one thing that you just said, and I know something I can relate to you said, you know, fish where the fish are. 
you know, my fear is that you can give me the best bait, you can give me the best reel, and you can give me a, a pond or a lake that is just overflowing with fish that are hungry, and I'm still not going to catch anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, then we need to get with, let's talk about step one. Because yeah, like I got skunked last weekend. Well, I don't know. I caught one fish. My wife caught two. So I feel like I got skunked because you got one more than me on a brand new rod I just bought her that was pink. So I was feeling a little bad about myself last weekend. So, But let's talk step one because I think that's where it really happens. And like wholesaling seems super attractive. It re really does. But there's a whole lot of work that goes into it. It seems so simple that a lot of people don't think about the work. And so let's jump into step one, which for me, step one is creating a blueprint. And so this is the whole idea of reverse engineering our success. I want to make a deal happen. How many appointments do I need to go on? How many offers do I need to make? How many conversations do I need? How many prospects do I need to talk to? How many properties do I end up needing to find? What percentage of those am I gonna get phone numbers on? And I can reverse engineer our success. And so we call it creating a blueprint. So the first step in all of that is what we talked about with the zip codes, where we find out where the most cash buyers are. And then we reverse engineer the success with that and say, here's the zip codes we're going to work. This is how many properties per week I need to add to my list. And the way that we add properties to our list is we drive and do what's called driving for dollars. We find the zip codes where the most fix and flips are happening. We're driving up and down the streets looking for properties that are in distress. We're looking for things that have caved in roofs or nobody's living there or it's overgrown yards or it's in bad condition or there's blue tarps on it or a variety of different things. We have 30 or 40 different things you're looking for. And as you do, you mark it on the phone. And then as you get back to the office or to your house, you then find those, you skip trace those numbers. So you get the cell phone numbers for those people. And then we're then calling them and asking them if they'd be interested in selling their house. And the reason we're going for those is we look and see if they have equity before we're gonna skip trace them. And we know that there's probably motivation because they can't sell that property on the open market. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, totally. Um, you know, coming from a financial advisor background where I built my business doing cold calling, you know, it was all a numbers game, you know, make so many dials, make so many contacts, uh, so many live calls, send out your business cards, so many people like there was so much research and studies show like the more dials you make, the more people you talk to, eventually, you're going to get somebody that's willing to invest with you. And I imagine it's the same thing. You know, it's all about the contacts, obviously finding the right, the right properties as well. But it's a contact game. Well, and that's one of the reasons I like the driving is because bigger investors that are sending out lots of postcards, like I've got a buddy that spends $100,000 a month in marketing, right? He is not going to get in his car and drive around and find these properties. So he's just blasting it out. He's trying to find people that have equity. He's trying to find out of state owners or non-owner occupied or whatever the case is that he's blasting out. But he's trying to use his money, not as much as time to make it happen. When you get in the car and you identify these properties, they can't sell that property. They have two options. They got to spend the time and money and fix the property up, or they've got to sell it to a cash buyer. Those are their two options. If I have eyes on the ground and I have seen the property, I'm like, that property is going to struggle to sell on an open market because of the condition of the property and no real homeowner isn't going to buy it. They're going to have to buy with cash or get hard money. Then I, I'm finding properties that potentially my competition isn't finding. So I'm driving around finding those. And on average, you're going to find about, two, depending upon your marketplace, but anywhere from 20 to, to 30 properties an hour, if you're looking in the right neighborhoods where the fix and flips are happening is, is what you're going to find. And that's this reverse engineer success. And so if we say, hey, I'm willing to drive four hours a week and I'm going to make phone calls for four hours a week and I'm going to add 20 properties an hour, then we can reverse engineer the success and say, OK, it's going to take you 25 weeks to find a property or 30 weeks to find a property or 10 weeks to find a property based upon that. And then every single week you're updating those numbers, making those phone calls and looking for somebody. And this is a big thing I've got to make sure everybody's on the same page. This is not about trying to take advantage of somebody or negotiate them or try and get this crazy, amazing deal where they're losing and you're winning. The option here is how do I get a win-win? So let me give you an example. Like I did this for somebody where grandma passed away, grandpa's living in the home, the home's in horrible condition. It's held together with duct tape and bailing wire. And so grandpa ends up tripping, he gets ill and they need to put him in an assisted living center. But the house is a disaster. He has no money except for what's in the house and he's got equity in the house. They put him in a home, they've got enough money for the first few weeks, but they need money right away. So I purchased the property and as is condition, they got cash 
cashed out and got the money. They were able to set grandpa up so he was good for many, many years to come and they didn't have to deal with the house at all. That's a situation where they need the money, they need it now, they don't wanna put money into it, they don't wanna deal with putting it on the market or dealing with an agent or having showings or hoping they'll close. They want somebody that has the money, either hard money, and they're writing me Christmas cards every year telling me how great I am that I did that for them. That's the type of thing I think about when it comes to wholesaling, where there's an opportunity where they need this service that they can't get otherwise. That's a great story. I'm glad that you shared that. Just as like a real life example, that's a win-win. Also addressing the fact like you're not trying to screw anybody, you know, take advantage like, oh, like when they could get $150,000 and you're trying to low ball them at 90 because like, they don't have all the information. So yeah, I'm glad yeah. you pointed that but, out. But I want to take that even a step further because before I'll actually go and meet with somebody, if I'm calling them, so I drove around, I found these properties to call, hey, would you have an interest in selling the property? Am I talking to the owner one, two, three Main Street? If I get into a dialogue and they have interest, before I'll go on the appointment to meet them, I'll say, okay, Jeff, you could list this property with an agent, maybe get a little bit more money. You'd have to have showings and all that stuff. I'm an investor. I can't pay that same amount. Why would you want to sell to me versus working with an agent or doing that? And if they can't convince me why they'd rather work with mm -hmm. me, why it's a better interest to work with me, I shouldn't go on that appointment. It's not a good appointment for me and it's not a good appointment for them. Now that may be, I don't want people coming in my house. That may be, I don't want my neighbors to know what my house looks like. That may be, I don't have time. That may be, I've got bills that are that could be a variety of different things. But if they don't see the advantage of working with me as an investor, knowing that they'll take less money, potentially take less money. Now they won't have to pay agent fees. I'll pay the title, you know, I'll pay a bunch of stuff to make it to help them. But if it doesn't make sense for them to take less to work for me, if there's not a reason why they should do that, I'm not a good fit for them. I'm not trying to talk someone into to taking less than what it may be, may be worth. I'm trying to find the opportunities where I can be of service. Great, I love it. So we've got the blueprint and then we've got- Step you, one's you the blueprint. Blueprint, okay. So let's, are we going on to step two? Yeah, let me just, you probably have some listeners that are really wondering. I think you've got to add, I think you've got to find about um, 1,200 to, in different markets, 1,200 to 1,500 properties before you'll find a deal. And you're going to end up having to call, you usually, when you do a skip trace, you're going to get three or four phone numbers. Some of them are going to be out of date and not good and that stuff. But I think you're going to have to make about, you know, three to 4,000 phone calls. You won't talk to everybody, but you're going to have to make that kind of phone calls to end up with a deal statistically, right? There's no guarantees, but I know somebody's going to be like, well, what's it going to take for me to get a deal? I think you're going to have to dial three to 4,000 people. Skip Trace. Um, you've said that a few times. I kind of like nod in my head. Like, I think I have a decent understanding what that is, but just for those that may not know, including myself, what exactly Thank are you. we doing here? So the concept, so skip tracing used to be like private investigators when they were like doing, trying to find somebody and that type of stuff. You would hire a private investigator to do a skip trace, which was basically going to every public record to try and find where someone left their phone number. So this could be utility bills. This could be IRS documents. It could be whatever. Well, now with the, with the age that we're in, with the, information age, I can click a button actually on my cell phone and I can get the phone number for the person that lives there. And I'll get their phone number, their email address, their cell phone number. But what it's going to give me is the last three or four phone numbers that we think are the best ones that are there. And occasionally about 15, 20% of the time, we can't find any numbers for somebody, but you click a button, you pay, you know, 20 cents or whatever per skip trace. And you're going to get a multitude of numbers that are going to be the, the best known number for that individual and email address. So for somebody that's never done this for the first time, I could, I know how I felt the very first time that I cold called somebody. I mean, I about puked and peed <laughs> all over myself. <laughs> uh, can, can you share just some good example, like just one example of you reaching out completely cold where somebody actually was willing to talk to you? Yeah. Like it, it can't happen. Oh yeah, yeah, but it's the minority, it's not the majority. So you've yeah. got to get really used to it. One of the cool things about this strategy is I'm not calling to sell you anything. I'm not mm -hmm. saying, hey, you want to join my multi-level, you know, whatever. I'm calling to say, hey, I drove by the house on 123 Main Street. Are you the owner? I just wonder if you have any interest in selling your property. And lots of people are going to say no, you know, or they're going to say some other choice word and hang up on you or whatever the case is. And that's okay, right? But then what's going to happen is occasionally someone's going to say, you know, I might be interested. Now, one of the things is don't lose your temper. Realize you are going to get a whole lot of no's and every no is closer to someone that may be interested. Um, and you're just going to be willing to, to grind through that. And that's kind of the grind. 
Um, but then occasionally you know, somebody says, yeah, I, I'm interested. Well, tell me about your property. What are you looking to do? What are you looking to sell? And, and some of those are going to be people that are already listed with an agent that are like, oh yeah, I want to sell it. I want a million dollars for my house. That's just not a good deal. But once you make a thousand calls or 2000 calls, you're going to get someone that's like, you know what? Yeah, we need to, this is the situation. And then that's where like the human element comes in. It's like, what's going on? You know, how can I help you? You know, I'm going through a nasty divorce. We're going through a bankruptcy. You know, we lost our business. You know, we can't pay the payment. We're trying to get some equity out of it before we get foreclosed on. That's when this whole human element comes into it. And that's where I'm like, cool, I can help you. Let me tell you how things work. I'm an investor. I buy the property. And I go through that type of thing so that we're on the same page. And then I ask them, well, why would you want to work with me rather than working with an agent that might get you more money? Well, we're going to get foreclosed on in a month. I don't have time to do that. Okay, wonderful. I might be a good fit. Let's talk. Let me come over there. Yeah, that's good. That's good. All right. So we've got the blueprint. Now we're talking about some blueprint. software, right? Step two is you've got to have a software to do these things. I recommend a driving software that will actually map where you drive because we've identified one or two zip codes where we know the most fix and flips are happening in those areas. We put our blueprint together so we know how many properties we need to add a week. So I need a software that helps me know where I'm driving, where I've driven, where I haven't. I can identify properties right when I'm there so I can add it. And then I can, I can skip trace right from the software. And then I then download that and put it into a caller, which is called Mojo. And that actually makes calls. It calls three or four people at the same time. If it ends up getting two, it leaves a voicemail for them and I call them right back. And then it helps with call reluctance. Like you said, puking and being the first time you make some of these calls. One of the things I find most is call reluctance where somebody's like, uh, I'm just scared to do it. And it's a lot easier to hit a button and not hear the phone ringing. And then all of a sudden it's like, hello. And you're like, hey, um, I was calling about 123 Main Street. Are you the owner? Would you have any interest in selling the property? And then at the end, this is, this is a pro tip. Even when somebody's like, no, I'm not. I say, do you know anybody else that would be interested in selling? Always, right? Because occasionally they'll be like, yeah, you know what? I've got another property. Do you have another property or do you know anybody else that'd be interested in selling? So that's one of the things. But step two is getting a software to help with making the calls, a software to help track the drives and a software that's going to help you do the skip traces and help you add these properties into a list. Because again, we're talking volume. You've got to get a lot, but lots of people. And this is why, you know, as you talk about a lot of people dabble in real estate, but they don't get really serious because there's a lot of work that goes into it. Wholesaling seemed really simple earlier when we're like, oh, get it under contract, sell it for 20 grand more. Well, now now we start in unpeeling the onion and it's like, oh, wow, I've got to find a thousand properties. I'm going to make 4,000 phone calls. Now you get into why somebody gets paid to do this. I know like for me, like having, you know, run a, a business and knowing that there's different softwares and different tools that you can purchase, you know, all of a sudden I start hearing the cash register, like, okay, well, how much is this software? And then how much is this and this? And next thing you know, you're spending, you know, a couple thousand dollars a month and you haven't landed a deal yet. What are some of these that you feel like are a necessity at the beginning? Whereas some of the ones you can wait until you actually have some money, any preference, like the, the driving software, the, the calls, cause I'm also thinking yeah. of track, keeping track of everybody that you've called, you know? And if you yep. get somebody that's, oh, follow up with me next week. Like yeah. that sounds simple, except if you've made, you know, 10,000 calls since then, like you're going to forget. Yeah, I think ideally you're going to need, if you had $3,000 to kind of get started with, I think that's ideal. If you don't, you can do it like I did, which you get three by five cards and write it down and you, yes. you know, you trade them out and do that type of stuff. The skip tracing you need, right? But skip mm -hmm. tracing, you're paying like 20 cents a lead or something. So you need that. I really think the driving, you can get out a map or use Google Maps or try and figure all that type of stuff out. So you could do that on your own. Skip tracing, you're gonna need, but that's a paper. Sometimes there's a subscription, but it's usually like 20 cents per one that you do. And then you're going to have a caller, which you can make the calls manually. I really recommend a phone dialer. It's gonna be anywhere from 100 to $200 a month. But if you have a couple thousand dollars saved up to get started, it's gonna make it a lot easier. And it's like I tell people, it's time or money, right? Yeah. The money you spend is gonna save you time if you don't have that, you need to plan on it taking you double as long as it would take somebody else. So maybe it's going to take somebody else 20 weeks to find a deal. It may take you 40 weeks to find a deal. 
because they're willing to invest some money to speed up that process. And so you've just got to be cognizant of that because I have a lot of people that maybe don't have a lot of money, but then they have the same ex expectations. They'll get it done a lot faster than other people that are spending more money. And it doesn't really work like that. It's so funny. Like I, you're, you're talking about like the dialer and just the more calls you make. I'm thinking of like Will Smith, Pursuit of Happiness, you know, when he's making his cold calls and how he doesn't actually hang up the phone. Uh, he doesn't take water breaks. And I could even think back in when I was in training uh, as a financial advisor, like we were in this breakout room, there was like 15 of us all making cold calls, like in the same room that we talk about nerve wracking. The most successful guy in our class, you know, he wasn't smarter than me or anybody in that class. When we found out like why he was so successful is because he was making on average three to 500 dials a day like wow. every day, you know, until he just couldn't because he had too many appointments and client meetings. But I mean, he ended up break, like he was doing so like just leaps better than everybody else in our class. And it wasn't because he was smarter, didn't because he, he inherited like his dad's book of business. It's just because he worked and worked and made calls and made calls and made calls and it was just efficient with his time. So yeah, I, I'm glad that you shared that. That's what it takes, man. You gotta be committed, right? So we got this, the software and now, Step three is step three is where we actually start driving. Now we alluded to it earlier. Now we're actually in the car. We've got our software set up. We've got our blueprint. Now we're actually out there driving and we've got to put the the time in. This is how we actually find the properties. We look for properties that have problems. We're looking for broken down cars. We're looking for properties that have broken windows. We're looking for overgrown trees or shrubs and the grass is too high. We're looking for things that have zoning violations or notices on the door, foreclosure notices, anything that would make this very difficult to sell on the open market where an agent's gonna be like, you're gonna to need to fix that before we sell the property or where a lender is gonna say that doesn't qualify for FHA standards, anything like that. Some people get really caught up on this. Just add it. The, the worst case, if you see something, just add it. The worst case is it's gonna cost you 25 cents to skip trace it and you're gonna spend 10 minutes of your time making a couple of calls. So I would just add it, but you don't wanna add every property, right? When you drive down the street and the ones that are the nuisance that everybody in the neighborhood's like, I wish somebody would fix that property up. That's the type of stuff you're trying to add to your list. And you just hit a button, I will write it down. And those are the ones that you'll then skip trace, make the phone calls on. Have you ever had any situations where you're out driving for dollars and you see a property and for whatever reason, you're like, I don't want to skip trace that. I actually want to go knock on the door because I think that is a property that I could make some money on. Is that advisable? Should you be wearing like a bulletproof vest? Uh <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have. I have done that. And more than once, I think it really comes down to knowing your neighborhood. Like there was one over here where I went and knocked on the door, nobody answered, but it just depends if it's a rougher neighborhood, you may not want to. I have done a skip trace for my cell phone and called people mm. while I was sitting right in the driveway. I've also knocked on the door. So I would say, just be smart about that. One of the rules for me investing, uh, this is a, this is a big tip is I only invest in areas where I'm comfortable that my wife can walk down the street at night alone. So if I'm not comfortable she can walk down the street at night alone or your daughter or whatever that I don't want to invest in those areas now that's not doesn't mean there's not money to be had there and I know friends that invest in what I call war zones and they like that that's just not what I like to do it typically is more profitable but it's more maintenance it's more hands-on there's more issues but that's one of the rules for me so anywhere I'm going to be investing I'd be comfortable knocking on a door but it does slow you down quite considerably and when I'm trying to do a numbers game if I mm -hmm. do jump out and do that that's going to take me an hour um, yeah. or 30 minutes or something. It slows down the progress where I could just make the call. And like we say, it's a numbers game. I got to get 1200 properties to get to one. Uh, it's going to take me a lot longer to do that, but I may have better success face to face when I'm talking to them. Mm -hmm. So you just got to be cognizant of that, right? That's a, who knows? It just depends on who the seller is or who the person is. Yeah. I don't know if this applies in this situation. I know for me, you know, making the cold calls and, you know, and I lived in, in a smaller area where calling people just assumed I was a telemarketer. I mean, they made all their assumptions, you know, sure. of, of who I was and whether I was even like from the area and all this stuff. And I remember there were several instances where I had talked to these people time and again, time and again, and they would never come to the office. Mm. And I finally just offered like, hey, do you mind if I just stop by, you know, just to introduce myself? And they accepted. I mean, there were two people in particular and me making that effort then to go meet with them, they became clients like within like the next meeting or two. 
keep in mind that's what we want to do we're calling them and saying hey are you interested let me come to your house and let's talk right that's yeah. kind of the next step yeah okay perfect so we're driving for dollars i love all the stuff you shared and now we're now yeah. step four is actually making the call so we drove we found these broken down cars we found some fire damage we've added them to our list we hit the skip trace because we got the software in step two and now we're actually like let's do it now i'm old school man so before dialers and all this type of stuff i can dial as fast with my left hand as i can with my right hand because i used to have two of those old school phones i'm dialing mm -hmm. with both i've got the headsets on my sides you know going crazy because i i dialed both because here's how i was raised i was calling renters asking asking them if they'd be interested in buying a house for the same amount they paid in rent. I was a real estate agent. I was on the loan side. My wife, my bride, we just got married. She was an agent on the other side and I was calling people. She'd show them houses. I'd help them with the loan. And so that's kind of how I got very comfortable with getting some thick skin. But we've skipped trace these guys and now it comes time to call them. And I'll tell you, this is why I said earlier, invest in some software for this because for 200 bucks a month, I can get unlimited calls and I can call thousands of people and it helps so much with a call reluctance. Rather than me having to manually dial for hours, I can spend 30 minutes and get as much done as I would have. It'll leave voicemails and that type of stuff. Here's my script, you know, hi, I'm looking for the owner, 123 Main Street. I've got a random question. I'm looking to buy a house in the area. Wondered if you'd be interested in selling. That's it. That's it, that's mm -hmm. it. And you're either gonna get no or heck no, or some other maybe not so nice thing. Most people are kind and they're like, I'm not interested. And then I say, do you know anybody else that may be interested or have any other property you'd be interested in selling? No, I'm not, hang up, great. Occasionally somebody will swear at me and every once in a while, every once in a long while, somebody will say, oh, yeah, I actually am. No, but think about this. You already have identified the zip code you want to be in. You've already driven by the property and know that there's, you know, that it's vacant or won't qualify for FHA or there's fire damage. You're talking to somebody that's going to have a hard time selling that on the open market with an agent. You're talking to a really qualified person for you to be able to help them in this type of a wholesale deal. Now, this is where the magic happens. Mm -hmm. that's, that's so good. And one thing I'd also add, if somebody's listening to this or watching this and they get to the point where you're making that dial, I know something I was always told was put a smile on your face. Because when you have a smile on your face, you just sound more energetic and like the person can tell as opposed to, hey, uh, I'm just calling to see if you are interested in selling your house. Uh, I'm sorry to bother you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Um, well, and I've got a guy I'm helping right now, right? I've got a guy I'm actually kind of coaching. He's a friend of mine, you know, I'm kind of coaching. We're filming it all. So I'm filming everything. Mm. And this guy has, he has lots of phone experience, right? He's spent lots of time on the phones and everything else. And it's amazing to me, he's got a decade of phone experience, but then you change his environment where he's calling this and it's like brand new all of a sudden. And I'm listening to his call, I'm like, dude, you're totally messing up. And he's like, I know I'm messing up. So that's one of the other things that happens here is like, you've got to sound natural and you've got to sound personal personal and you've got to be kind and you've got to be relatable and you don't want to just be robotic. It may take you a little time to start feeling in the groove with that. And the only solution to that is just doing it mm -hmm. and kind of getting comfortable and kind of filling out who you are in that environment and how to make that. But I agree with you. If you come across like a robot, your success rate will go down immensely. Something that you said earlier that I totally resonated with was, you know, every no get you closer to a yes. And for those that have never cold called before, that probably doesn't mean a lot to them, but like that was the game that I had to play because if I didn't, if I based my success on whether I found a new property, you know, whether I found something I was gonna make money on and that didn't happen that day or that week, then like that was a fail, <laughs> an epic fail, as opposed to like, oh, how many people did I talk to today? You know, how many maybe were interested in maybe talking to? Um, and every time I got a no, like I would just, I, I learned to just chuckle and like, okay, they're, they're not ready, that's fine. Somebody out there is ready to say yes. So just making those, the, the calls to find that that person. So yeah, it's just, that's that's how I had to like, reprogram, you know, how I made calls and continue to make calls.
Well, and that's why I like our guys, like keep track of how many conversations you had. Even if the guy says not interested, I want to know how many not interested it takes yes. to get to somebody that, and then I call it a prospect. A prospect is somebody, you, you know, or, or we do conversations, then we go to prospects and then we go to the appointments and you know, the prospect, they may be interested. And so then we get a ratio. And then once you know your numbers <laughs> and you're like, on average, if I talk to 200 people, one of them is going to be interested. Great. Yeah. So then you're like, put 200 on the whiteboard and start scratching off. Okay, I'm at 90, I'm at 80, I'm at 70. Because mm -hmm. statistically, it's kind of like the NBA player. If he takes enough threes, he's going to end up hitting enough, you know, hitting his percentage. That's what you're trying to get into. And then it becomes a game. So you've, you've, you've got the courage, you made the call, uh, you've spoke to a few people, you found somebody that is interested. I think this is step five is step booking five. your appointment. This is the appointments, right? And before I talked about it earlier, but you've got to make sure why would you be interested in selling to me as an investor versus listing it with an agent or selling somebody else? You've got to get an, an answer. The prospect has to tell you why they would want to do that versus selling it before you go on this appointment. But then you're also going to gather information about the property. So tell about the property, tell me about you, that type of stuff. And then when we set that firm appointment, we are going to then go on the property. Before we go to the property, we're going to research our comps. We're going to know our values. We're going to build a relationship with them. We're going to walk through the property. We're going to ask them what's wrong with the property. And they're going to be the right property. They're going to be like, that's a mess. This is a mess. This is a disaster. You know, like help me, right? I don't have a lot of options. Please help me with this. We're taking pictures of everything. Then we go to a contract and say, Hey, here's what I'll do. And what I typically do with that say, um, what do you want for it? We kind of do the price game. I usually end up having to pay a little bit more than what I normally would like to in almost every situation. And so what I typically say to them is, Hey, you know what? Let's go under contract. I'm not positive if I can pay this price, the 105 that you were hoping. I really wanted to be at 95, but I'll tell you what, let's go on our contract at $105,000. Give me two or three weeks and let me get my contractor in here. Let me figure things out. Let me talk to some of my other partners, i.e. my wholesalers that I'm in wholesale to. And let me see if I can make this thing happen. If I can, then we'll move forward. And if I can't, then we'll go out of contract You'll give me back the earnest money and we'll part as friends. Does that sound okay with you? And I really like to set that up with genuineness so that they know that there's a chance this isn't going to work out because if I can't find somebody I'm going to want to sell this property to, they're going to want to do that, then I may not want to move forward with the contract. Now, luckily, I write that into the contract. I tell them that up front and most of the sellers like, that makes a lot of sense to me. Now, on the reverse side of that, some of you may be saying, well, you just marked it up $10,000 and gave it to somebody else. They may have been able to make $10,000 more. No, they wouldn't be able to because I've had to cultivate relationships with my buyers. I've called my buyers. I've lined them up. I know who they are. I have relationships with them, right? I've spent the money marketing, right? So I'm getting paid to facilitate a service here to make this all happen. That's good. That's so good. So you've talked about, I mean, the, the script, you make a call. Uh, when you go to the appointment, do you have some sort of checklist? You know, when people like if they're doing it for the first time or they use for a few times, making sure that they're asking like everything you mentioned about question to ask, taking the pictures and all that stuff. Is that a resource that uh, that you have anywhere that people can have access to? Yeah, so we've got what's called a motivated seller sheet that I like to go through. So that's one of the things that is a resource we can make available uh, for sure. But the one thing I'll say with that appointment is do not be in a rush. I recommend spending counting on two hours being at the property. And some people are like, are you kidding me? Two hours? And I'm like, more is always better. Because really what I want to do is I want to go into the house. I want to sit down. I want to plop down on their couch and I want to get to know these people genuinely and sincerely. I want to get to know these people because they usually don't tell you what the problem is unless you have a relationship with them. And I've had mm -hmm. situations where I've paid for moving vans in advance, or I've helped people find new apartments because they didn't know where they're going to li live or move to, or, you know, help grandma or given an advance and put a loan against the property. Like I need to understand really what's going on. And they're not going to tell me that unless they're comfortable with me. And once I know what really is going on, then I can really help them the most because I, I almost bought an RV for a guy. He wanted an RV to travel the country. I'm like, I, he picked it out. I was going to go buy it. He was going to sell me the house. I was going to bring the RV there because that's what he needed. He didn't have the money to make it all happen. So like I can get really creative and that's really how I can help people out the most. So I really need to know what the problem is. And once I really know the problem and what their real motivation is, then I'm like, what do you need to 
make this work. Because once I can fulfill that need for them, the price and what they're paying and all those things are not as big of a deal. Let's go back to your Costco example. If I'm at the ball game and I want to drink a water, I'm going to pay five bucks for that. But I normally am going to pay 20 cents for that because I'm going to go to Costco. And it's the same situation I'm running into is if they're at the ball game and they don't have a lot of options and this fulfills their need, they're going to be grateful for it. I was at a Kansas City game. It was 104 degrees outside. I was dying. I paid, uh, you know, 50 bucks in water because I couldn't get enough of it, you know, and I was grateful for it. But I also could buy that at Costco, right? So it was it was the opportunity that I was in. So good. Love it. Okay, so we got the deployments, we got the checklist, and now we're looking for a motivated seller. Somebody has some cash. Is that what we're looking for? <laughs> cash buyer. Cash buyer. We already had our motivated seller. That's, that's who we right, had our right. appointment with. So now we're working on the cash buyers list. And so I alluded to this earlier, but once we've identified the zip code that we're in, we know the purchases that some of the properties been bought and sold. We're going to call a flip. And if it's happened within the same year, but the great news is, is I know who bought that property because they're on title. So I can then send postcards to those people, or I can skip trace the owners and then make phone calls. Now it's a little harder to skip trace businesses. So if it's an LLC, but lots of times I can go on the state's website and see who is the registered agent for the LLC and I can then call those. And so I'm trying to find out people who are doing business in that area, cash buyers, they're buying properties in that neighborhood. I've already done the research on it. Now I'm outreaching to them either through sending a postcard, doing a skip trace, making a phone call, looking at the registered agent. And I'm calling them saying, you just bought a property five months ago around the corner. I have a property just like it. Would you have any interest in buying it? You know, if they're an investor, they're like, heck yeah, I'm always looking to buy. If they're a landlord, they're like, I'm always looking for great deals. And I always end that conversation with, do you know anybody else that would be interested, right? Because I'm adding it. And then what I'm doing is I'm building my list. Even if he says, no, I'm not interested, I'm building a list. And even if you want to do that on a Google sheet and you're putting the name and the phone number and the email, great. And the other thing I do with those guys is say, what else are you looking for? Like, what's the ideal property? Because what's ideal to him is not ideal to somebody else. And like, I like to be under 200,000. I like to be over 200,000. I only like four bedrooms. I only like two, but I'm writing all this stuff down. And then it gets me even more excited because then I can target what those guys want. Oh, okay. So you're telling me if I get you a four bedroom between $200,000 and $500,000 in this area, that's a property you want. I'll buy those all day long. What would you pay for those? I'd pay $300,000. Great. Then I go out and look for those properties. And if I can get those for less than $300,000, I know Billy, who's on my list, is ready to go buy. Something that it kind of gets lost in all of this is... The people that you're talking to uh, for the potential investment properties, now you're talking to the cash buyers. You, you are building a tremendous network of people that could lead to who knows what, not just in, in real estate, could lose, lead to other business opportunities and, and or being able to help them out with something else, you know, that, that is completely uh, unrelated to real estate. You know, these are the things, the uh, strategic byproducts or the unintended consequences that, that come along with doing all this stuff. And I love the fact, like we're talking to other investors. I mean, it's like, oh, like I'm Ryan, like, hey, yeah, I talked to you about so-and-so property, you know, a couple weeks ago, got this other one. And like, and you, you start that dialogue and now, like if there's something that comes along, oh, I should talk to that Ryan guy. Like we kind of hit it off and, you know, now you're in his mental Rolodex, you know, be able to reach out to you. So that's, that's just all good stuff. Well, and I know guys, like I have funded guys on the other side, on the hard money side, I funded guys that buy stuff from wholesalers every month. You know, they have a relationship with a wholesaler, the wholesaler knows them, you know, they buy two or three deals a month from the same wholesaler. They know the wholesalers market up 20 grand, 10 grand, 30 grand, mm -hmm. whatever. They're happy to do that. And I'm happy to fund the transaction as well. And they know that this guy's going to perform. And that's one of the big things that a wholesaler needs. If I have found a motivated seller and I know the family and I know grandpa needs to go in the rest home and I know how critical this situation is, I need to make sure I have a buyer that is really going to perform so that I don't let these guys down because they really need that. Now I've set it up with integrity and said, it may not happen at this price, but give me a few weeks and let me see so that I can do that with integrity. But I want to make sure I've got good buyers. And that, that kind of brings us to step seven. Yeah. And what is number seven? Seven's the actual closing. 
This is going to be a little bit different based upon what state you're located in, because some states hate wholesalers, some states love wholesalers, some agents think it competes with them, you know, you name it. So there's a few different ways from doing an assignment of contract to doing a double closing, you know, so there's different a simultaneous closing. So there's a few different ways, but essentially, it, with one of them, you're selling in the piece of paper and the person's paying you for that piece of paper. That all could happen at the closing table. At another one, you're actually buying and then you're selling to them, but their funds are paying for it. And in another situation, you actually have to bring funds, which you can get from a hard money lender, and then they have to bring their own funds separate and then the closing happens. And that's going to be a little different based upon what state. But in the end, you're going to a title company or a closing attorney. You're setting everything up properly so everyone's protected. Everybody's bringing their funds. You're everybody's signing and everybody's walking away. If you've done it right, everybody's walking away happy. Something, I don't know if we, we mentioned this, um, is there starting off, like are there certain people, accountants or title companies, like attorneys, like just people that you should start at least making some introductions because you may need their services when you start doing this more proactively. Like, is there any, anybody that would be wise to just like start relationships with to just like introduce yourself? You're always going to need a closing company. And depending, there's title states and attorney states, there's always title insurance. So it's either going to close through an escrow officer at a title company, or it's going to close through an attorney state. So it just depends on where you're located, if it's an attorney state or a title state, but making a relationship, but not just with anyone, you really want to make a relationship with somebody that's very investor friendly. There are some title companies who are like, we hate investors. I don't know why. I don't understand that. <laughs> But there's some of them that just don't like investors dare for you. that reason. Yeah, it's like, you're going to make money on this. I'm like, I know. And everybody knows. And that's one of the things like, you know, when your seller knows you're making money on this transaction and they are thrilled that you're making money, you know, everybody's happy. I don't try and hide the fact that I'm trying to make money, which is why I say it in the very first phone conversation. Now, I don't say it as soon as out of the gates. I say it once I've gotten a relationship on the phone and say, hey, well, I'm an investor. This is what I do. But I want to make sure everybody knows and I want to provide enough value and I want to be creative enough that I'm doing something nobody else can do for them. And they're more than happy for me to make a make a profit by doing that. That's the the win, win, win situation. Right, this has been so good, man. Like I, I, my hope was you could introduce wholesaling and break it down simply where people could understand it, digest it. I also love that this is not, um, I don't know if it's like a YouTube ad where it's like, if you want to make an extra thousand dollars a month, <laughs> this is all you got to do. Just go out and find a property and flip it and blah, blah, blah. So uh, I love the fact, you know, just the, the dials, like how many calls you have to make, how many properties you have to find. And I'm sure those, the law of averages, I also have to assume that there are people that will find a property you know, within their first 100 dials possibly. I mean, I'm not saying it, it's always gonna happen, but I mean, it's just one of those, it ain't gonna happen until you take some action and start doing something. Yeah, absolutely. So for those that want to find more about what you stand for, what you do, where can they check you out? Yeah, check us out. So I've got a podcast called Income Hacker. You can check us out there. Um, or my main company is called Do Hard Money. And what we do is we provide funds for these types of transactions, whether it's a wholesale transaction, you need the money, or it's a fix and flip. Actually, the majority of my customers are uh, actually doing fix and flips where they're buying the property, fixing it up. Uh, but wholesaling is a great way to kind of get started. Um, and we even have some, some joint ventures where if you find a property, we'll bring one of our buyers to the property and provide them the funding. And then you don't even have to worry about finding a buyer. So hmm. you can check us out over at uh, dohardmoney.com as well. So good, man. Appreciate you taking your time to share your wisdom and expertise to the Wealth Hacker and Good Financial Sense community. Oh, I love being with you, Jeff. You're 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 a delight to be with and to talk to. So I love I love it. Awesome, man. We'll I'll have a link to all this if people want to come check you out, and we'll talk to you soon, man. Appreciate it.